Oh yeah, working on my soul intro still. Welcome to episode 47 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. This month I had the pleasure of speaking to my good friend Soul. I've been wanting to do this interview for a long time and grateful we finally made it happen. Soul is a rapper, a hip hop artist, organizer, father, friend, podcaster, collaborator, gardener, revolutionary, and a seed planter. His current podcast project is Propaganda of the Seed. Soul's latest album is Post American Studies with producer DJ Payne One that they just released on Scott Crow's label Emergency Hearts Records. In this episode, we talk about how Soul navigates being an artist, Soul's relationship with permaculture and land, touring in radical spaces, interacting with time, curiosity, and a deeper dive into post American studies. Thank you to Awareness for the music, and here's a jingle from a fellow Channel Zero Network member. What's up, y'all? I'm Pearson, host of Coffee with Comrades. Coffee with Comrades is rooted in militant joy. Our hope is to cultivate a warm and inviting atmosphere, like walking into your favorite coffee shop to sit down with some of your close friends and share a heart-to-heart conversation. New episodes premiere every Tuesday, so be sure to smash that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast so that you never miss an episode. We are proud to be a part of the Channel Zero Network. I just wanted to say thank you for doing this interview. It's been a long time coming, and I'm excited to talk to you. I love the new album, Post-American Studies, and I've looked up to you even before we were friends. You were one of my favorite rappers. When I was in high school with Ice Cube and Raz Kaz and Soul, like in Talib Kweli, Most Def, Feral Monch, like all of you were so instrumental to me as an artist and, and learning just my education. So thank you. Well, you know, man, I really value our friendship. Um, you know, it's cool. I, it's cool to hear that you, you know, bought my shit in high school, but, you know, we uh, collaborate. We've been co-travelers in the world of uh, anarchy and hip hop and uh, activism for whatever, man, over a decade at this point. And, uh, you know, it's been a fun ride and it's been cool. You know, I don't know all the things we've worked on together and good times we've had. And so, uh, yeah, here we are on your podcast, you know, good times yeah. all around. It's awesome. Life is yeah. good. Life's fucking hard, but yep. we, we have our, uh, little joys here and there and things we can look back on and, uh, you know, look around and be like, oh shit, we have, you know, little platforms and shit now. We can do stuff. Yeah. And thanks for all the work on your your podcast, the Soulcast. I was on there and that opened me up to a lot of new people, which I was grateful for. And then Propaganda the Seed. Love that podcast too, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thanks, man. I've really uh, been enjoying your podcast also. It's uh, you know, <laughs> it's really good. It's really you ask really fucking good questions. You Thank really you. get you really drill in deep on people's stuff. And so I'm afraid of the kind of questions that could be asked today. <laughs> I just might not be deep enough. <laughs> no, no, you you're very deep. <laughs> you're very deep. So this is a this is a really wide question that probably has a lot of different nodes to it. But I was wondering, can you explain when you first started questioning? the propaganda and the spectacle of white supremacist, capitalist, imperious patriarchy. And I'm aware this is an ongoing process. And your music has always had radical roots, even from learning to walk to Man's Best Friend 2, where on Little Bank Anthem, you say you're an anarchist, to selling live water, you're saying cops ain't shit to me. And how do you get from, from those songs to One Shovel? the opening track to your latest album, Post-American Studies with DJ Payne One. I mean, I suppose I, you know, my eyes were first opened to these uh, ideas when I was a kid listening to rap music, when I was listening to X-Clan, Public Enemy, Boogie Down Productions, uh, all this stuff that had a Black nationalist bent to it. Uh, I was very into the Black Panthers and Malcolm X when I was in like 
late middle school, early high school. And that stuff kind of, I don't know, played a huge role in my development. But yeah, I don't think I, I definitely didn't connect all the dots until much later in my life. Um, I was actually thinking before we did this interview, how like one of the things you and I have been co-travelers on has been kind of, you know, uh, is uh, as li liberals, you know, we both came, came into this, you know, I think like 15 years ago when we first met and stuff, we were both kind of liberal, you know, and just had this sort of like vague notion of anti-racism and war is bad, you know, and then like, you know, you can still be an anti-imperialist and think you're an anti-imperialist and like read Howard Zinn and things like that and still be have a kind of like liberal, not like, like more of a liberal mindset, like. Um, and so it really took a lot, it really took getting in the streets and Occupy and like kind of, you know, asking these questions and seeing these things like, hmm, why is it a lot of white people? Hmm, why is it mostly white dudes making decisions? Hmm, why, where, you know, why is it this way? Why, why is this happening? And then, you know, having uncomfortable conversations and kind of seeing the way things go, it makes it really clear that, you know, I don't know, like as a white dude, we really have to think really um, intentionally and act intentionally about these subjects in our lives. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, even if you do become aware to to colonialism or white supremacy or patriarchy, like they're always going to keep creeping back too. they have their opportunities to creep back when you hit your default. And, yeah, that's what you see so much with a lot of movements and things like that, where there's a lot of pain. Yeah, but we're also in a revolutionary um, moment here. Like, I don't know, it's akin to the French Revolution or something. And, and the pendulum is swinging. And, you know, the, the analysis is keep deepening. They keep getting sharper. And, you know, that's the whole idea of radicalism is to get to the roots and uncover the, uh, you know, uncover yeah. the, the hidden truths of the universe and uproot the bad shit and uh, fight the power and remake the world. Yeah. And then uh, you can hear that evolution in, in your art, too, because your art is so it's so vulnerable and raw and, and you just show where you are when you're writing these things. And I know 9-11 had a big awakening for you, too, as far as imperialism and, uh, and the, like your song from Live from Rome, like Sing, Sing Carne, like how you got from like what effect anarchism had on you, too? Like, when did you first encounter anarchism? Um, I encountered anarchism. Ravi Zupa gave me anarchism and other essays in like 2002. That's when I started reading like Marx and all this kind of stuff. And I, at the time I thought I was like a communist or some kind of Marxist or something, but then like really getting into politics one night, you know, Sky Ravi was like, you know, man, you're not a fucking communist. You're an anarchist. You should read Emma Goldman. And, uh, and so I read anarchism and other essays and it really just clicked. It made way more sense to me than communism did and uh just seemed a more like beautiful poetic place to start from if you're going to think about remaking the world um it makes more sense to start from like centering the human the the human experience than um industry which i think is like the one of the things that always happens with communism you know mm -hmm. it's like it's not it's it isn't built inherently to reject hierarchical power it's not built to reject hierarchical power the way um anarchy anarchy is supposed to and uh i mean of course there are a lot of like anti-authoritarian communists or like you know the sort of communization types who really are using the language of communism but in a way that i don't know their analysis i agree with mostly mm -hmm. so um, but so you're asking how to, what was the question? I don't know why I got lost on like a thing about communism. I thought I was a communist, decided, no, I'm an yeah, No, you answered it, yeah. But it never really meant anything to me. It never, it was just something I said I was and kind of, I just always thought of myself as like an anarcho-Marxist. And then, then when I moved to Denver, I started meeting other anarchists. I started meeting people who, who identified that way. And I didn't like, it wasn't like some big part of my identity. It was just something I... I just thought of myself as a revolutionary or something. And then when I started, you know, I don't know, working with anarchist collectives and within Occupy, seeing the way that like non-hierarchical decision-making processes and 
uh, direct action and just like seeing all this stuff up front. Really, we were talking about, you know, being liberals when we first met, um, you know, jokingly or whatever, but by um, Occupy kind of is what really got rid of a lot of those liberal notions for me was just seeing firsthand how direct action gets the goods. That's what drives history, you know, collective power. Uh, you know, it's just, it's fascinating, man. It's, it, that was a fascinating period in history. And I learned a lot in that time. Yeah. And so many people were sharing like information and books and then aim came down and learned like so much more just about problematic term of Occupy. And yeah, just such a big paradigm shift at that time. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about some, you you did a lot of organizing in Denver, like anti-police marches, uh, stuff on gentrification as well. And you talk about this in your music and even on older songs, like songs, songs that went tin, that song T-I-M, talking about Oakland and gentrification. I was wondering, like, what are some learning lessons you've you learned from organizing some wake up calls you had? What were some wake up calls I had organized? I mean, the biggest wake up calls I had with organizing was essentially writing checks that uh, our, our asses couldn't cash. Um, and, you know, there were there were there were times when we sometimes when we lacked the actual like power or organizing capacity to like really do do the things we wanted to do or how we wanted to do them um, as far as like direct action or blockades or whatever sometimes we would um, resort to um, bravado and uh, there were there were just a few times where I feel like there were you know arrests and people getting like hit by by cars and shit and I was just like man you know or like somebody who looks like me getting fucking arrested and I'm like man I think they were I think they were going for me and I'm messed up and this fucking feels like shit. And like, you know, things like that. It's like, I'm down with militancy. I am, but it's like, you know, unless you know, everyone's going to be super militant about it. I feel like just sometimes the, the, the words didn't match the deeds. And uh, I, don't know, I feel like there, there may have been a price to pay sometimes. And so I don't know, like, so looking back on things like that, um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot of like, I mean, obviously hard lessons about race and being a white dude and just learning to shut the fuck up and empathize more and how to just, I don't know, actually, you know, to really, I don't know. I, I never really sacrificed my politics in those spaces. And that's something I was, I always appreciated about the various relationships I had in Denver um, is that like, you know, even though there would be people that <clears throat> we wouldn't see eye to eye. Um, we would always keep like back channels open that allowed for things to happen in a more natural way sometimes rather than let like movement cops, you know, and liberals fuck with everything all the time uh, and just make everything whack and useless. And, you know, I mean, other things I learned, you know, also it's like kind of everybody talks about this stuff now was like about burnout and shit. And just like, sometimes you just got to fucking chill. And sometimes like, if like, you know, your organ, my organizing would be like making me neurotic. I'd be like, you know, super stressed. Like, oh, how come nobody else wants to do this thing? It's so important. Then it's like, if no one else sees the value in it, maybe it's not that important. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like maybe, maybe, uh, you know, just fucking chill out, you know, re regenerate your energy a little bit. You don't have to constantly be st bashing your head against a brick wall, you know? And like, when you take a step back, uh, it kind of gives you more, you know, you have more energy, you have more room to think strategically when you're constantly like reacting to things and scrambling. Yeah. And so like jumping from like one thing to the next, I think would be like another, I wouldn't say hard lesson, but something I learned is like, you know, I saw myself as like a, uh, general revolutionary as far as like how I moved throughout the city and organizing and agitating, you know, sometimes it'd be just good to, I don't know. I wish I could have just taken a step back a little more and uh, thought more strategically. Thanks for sharing all that. I was wondering kind of like how you, you've been an artist for a long time and, Too long. and on that, you know, an older song, poor is cool. You say achieved cult status. Now there's more people to please. I was wondering how you've navigated these expectations, but also have learned not to care. And also, how do you think about 
your evolution as an artist? Like, how do you handle these time spans? Um, what was the first part? What was the first question? The first sentence? Like, how have you navigated these expectations and learned not to care as an artist? Okay, okay, okay. I mean, I think it's just really good self-defense mechanisms honed through a childhood of abuse. And, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, really, it's like, you know, it started, it never really made sense to me a lot of times, like what my most popular songs are. Like, it doesn't make sense to me that Bottle of Humans is one of my most popular albums. Like Selling Live Water makes sense. But Bottle of Humans was like, a mixtape it wasn't even really an album and and so like what got popular and what people liked it just seemed like didn't always jive up with what i liked you know what i mean and you know there was like a point in the middle to beginning of my career where anticon this you know collectively run record label um that i was a part of and helped create um it uh i felt like the person who was running it was running things in a way that I believed was like contrary to our um, original mission. And it was things were like going in a more trendier way, you know? And so I had to like constantly like, like think to myself, like, is my shit, is my music worth anything? I've been shelved on my own fucking record label. You know what I mean? Like, does this shit matter? Like playing fucking empty shows, you know, putting out, you know, doing tours that just fucking sucked, you know, um, <clears throat> I had to really like, think about like, do I want to do this? Why am I fucking doing this? Who am I doing this for? You know? And I just got to a place where I figured out like that I could pretty much just fucking do whatever I wanted and people were going to support me on that. And, and if I let other people's shit like dictate what I, what I do, I'd be like making mindless music, you know, like even on an independent level, like, you know, you can like keep making the same song over and over again. And, uh, people will kind of just eat that shit up, you know, if you hit the right audience. And I just never enjoyed that. I never enjoyed, like, I got bored playing the same songs from like selling live water over and over again for like two years. You know, I couldn't imagine like having to play the same songs a hundred nights a year for the rest of my life. You know, that just sounds fucking boring. I might as well go work at a factory. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. And so that's why, you know, I just like have like an attitude about it. Like, I don't give a fuck. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of people who, you know, are like hinted at radical politics in my music. But then when I started doing the nuclear winter stuff, people started getting fucking pissed off, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I think that really helped me a lot to like weed out all those fucking idiot, uh, knuckleheads or whatever in the early, you know, mid 2000s, 2010s, because by the time Trump and shit had uh, come to power and the internet had just become crazy, and I, I'd already kicked a lot of those uh, shitheads off of my social media, I'd like weeded out a lot of that fan base already. Um, and so that was good too. But yeah, I don't know, man. I just try to, you know, I feel so grateful. Like I've been fucking doing this shit for 20 years, you know, I wake up in the morning. Some days I feel like making music. Some days I feel like doing other things. It's given me the freedom to do so many things and to keep doing so many things and to be a dad and shit, you know, and I've made compromises, you know, I couldn't afford to bring a band out on tour with me. If I had it my way, I would have always had a band like me and Payne one would have a would have a band. Um, I just couldn't afford to carry all those instruments around forever. I, yeah, I, and also it's just like, um, and the other thing uh, I'll add is just like, we're just in such a weird time where like you really just like the feedback you get on shit is just not like, we're like, we're all like trapped behind like algorithm walls and gated internet communities and platforms and yeah so many people are shadow banned and like you can't you got to pay for your own followers to even see your own posts yeah like even people who want to like my stuff you know what i mean like i'm not going to hear from those people on a day-to-day -day basis like hey i really like that new song you know what i mean i'm just not going to be hearing from those people because 
the way positive, the way you like positive feedback and shit has changed um, with the modern, more corporate um, internet that we have now. So it's, um, I mean, it's a strange time to be an artist. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think if you're an artist and you've been an artist for a while, you just think about it all the time. Like, wow, it's really weird time. Like right now in the pandemic, really weird time to be a musician. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. This next question is about is about sci-fi. So you have your project, World's Not Yet Gone, an awesome project, but other projects like The Pyre, your new album, Samples Ursula K. Le Guin. You handed me an Ian Books, Ian Banks book before, which was awesome. And one of your lyrics is I carry a new world on my sleeve. That's why I'm always digging. And you always have a lot of talk of futurism. I was wondering, like, the influence that sci-fi has had on you and has on you. I mean, I think the the influence of sci-fi is, like, one of the biggest influences in my life, really. Even, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, my first school project in grade one was a fucking chemical waste. Or grade two was a paper mache chemical waste dump, you know? Um, And it's like... I've always, I've just always been exposed. My parents were always watching shit like Mad Max and Thunderdome. Like that shit just really fucking stuck with me, you know? Um, And I just always, I mean, honestly, you know, my family also was like on this Edgar Cayce doomsday prophecy shit. And so I just always like really believe that like we lived in apocalyptic times since I was a kid. Um, And then when I learned about capitalism and global warming and civilization and all this other stuff, I, I, uh, I continue to uh, agree with that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something, you know, people talk about now, but it's something that I was thinking about a lot is just like how all the science fiction I read in all this, especially in Hollywood, it's just always portraying this negative, uh, vision of the future, like particularly negative vision of human nature, like, you know, hurricane Katrina, occupy Sandy, all these like horrible act, all these horrible natural disasters. You don't hear about people fucking robbing each other and killing each other in the streets. You hear about all you see is people helping each other. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what people do when shit goes bad. And the fact that like, we are told to constantly believe that when the, when, you know, whatever, when the shit hits the fan, uh, when everything goes, you know, whatever power goes out, capitalism fails, global warming makes, you know, eventually renders, you know, state power meaningless or, you know, combination or whatever we're looking at. We don't see a lot of positive visions for the future. Like you mentioned, Ian Banks, you know, I gave you that Ian Banks. He's one of the only people who wrote science fiction that he was based on like Murray Bookchin, post-scarcity anarchism. And, it, but, and, you know, it was like hyper-technological, but it was like, here's what, here's what could happen. We could have artificial intelligence mining rogue asteroids for all the things that we need, creating all the things we need without any need for human input. No one needs to work. We no need for war, et cetera. Like that makes fucking sense to me, you know, like that, that is one possible outcome. I think it's highly unlikely, (laughs) but like, at least it's a positive vision of the future that shows cooperation. And, you know, people like Margaret Killjoy and, um, you know, others are thinking about these things also. There's just, you know, I love science fiction because I love it as, as a form of escapism, really. It's just a good science fiction book can really just, you know, reading Dan Simmons or Octavia Butler, like I could, like that's, you know, I don't know, reading Parable of the Sower is like <laughs> one of my, uh, you know, great experiences of the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, what's cool is after I read that book, I learned about acorn flower, never knew about acorn flower. Then I moved here and now I make my own acorn flower, you know, learned it from that book. And so that's like the power of culture, music, art, literature. These things can get people in ways that plant really deep deep seeds in people's minds that, you know, maybe take 30 years before, you know, but you could be the person that nudges that person from being like a asshole at Amazon to someone who decides to go build open source applications to, you know, 
whatever solve fill in the blank you know Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's like it's the imagination is is important because what are we fighting for what what kind of world do we want to live in like if we you know it's like i don't know if it's zizek or who who said it but you know we can sooner imagine the end of the world than we can imagine the end of capitalism so probably should do some time really thinking about you know what's desirable what's beautiful you know or do crime think yeah and you know even before you got into uh, permaculture and gardening like you were planting seeds like with your music and with the way that you shared knowledge like the whole reason our paths cross was because of your art like you opened my mind to so much and the way you use your art to spread knowledge i was wondering if you could talk more about that like the zines you've made uh, you always recommended books in a lot of your releases I remember you hipped me to the poem Bomb by Gregory Corso. Nice. Uh, Second April by Bob Kaufman, which became like still one of my favorite poets. Uh, at a show once, you told me to read Lord Byron's. And then you told me uh, Emma Goldman. And that's what really opened my mind. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, um, I think it just always seemed like the right thing to do. You know, um, I think the 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 group that... I most resonate with historically is the situationists and Guy Debord, even though I don't think I would like Guy Debord as a person very much. Um, but who knows? He could be, his politics might be very different if he was alive today. He could very well be an anarchist. Not that, that really fucking matters that much, but they said go beyond art. And when I was, you know, when like I felt like selling live water and Anacon, I felt like it was like kind of getting big. And I was like, how are we going to use this shit? You know, like we should be like public enemy. You know, I want to be like public enemy. I want to be educating people. I want to be leaving breadcrumbs every chance I get that allows people to go out and pick these books up, learn about the things I'm talking about, catching these references. There were periods where I was like reading so much stuff that I felt like the people who who had been following me all these years would be their first time possibly encountering abolitionist ideas of, you know, a world without police or questioning the state or thinking outside of capitalism and, you know, all these ideas that I was like, you know, as I'd find out about them, I'd, you know, they say like the most newly converted are the most annoying, you know? And so when I was like, just learning everything, I just wanted to share it all. And I think part of that is because I always secretly wish I'd chosen a career as a professor instead of a rapper. I just know I'm not, I don't feel like I I'm disciplined enough ever to really do that. And I kind of, I like that, that I'm not a professor now. I like that I'm something else. Yeah. And so that's just what I wanted to do in, in lyric booklets. I'd want to put reading lists and, you know, because back then like stuff, it was different, like telling people on, on the back of a hip hop release, in 2002, check out Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, Guy Debord. That's that's not the same as today because today all that stuff is like you get on TikTok. You know, if you're a TikTok teen, you get you know woke 101, anti-colonial. You, you get it all as soon as you get on TikTok now. But back then, you kind of had to really dig around to to learn a lot of this stuff, uh, and it's. And that's why, and that's why like my method of engagement with it has changed. First, it was like little zines that first it was like reading lists. Then it was little zines. Then it was like a Tumblr blog of links. And then, then it became a podcast. And then, you know, when I started doing the soul cast, I was like the, I think the only other than like crime thing, one of the only like really theory based quote unquote theory, theory and, and art based like radical podcasts and that was 2013 and now it's like as i've like kind of stopped doing political podcasting the way i was um now there's like four or five radical musical podcasts you know multiple theory podcasts and there's just and yeah so it's been interesting to me to constantly like think about what's working what's not working what is an efficient uh, what's the word intervention in this moment? How can my skills, my time, my effort, my labor be best used in this moment? And um, inevitably, I think that's why I end up 
doing the propaganda by the seed thing the most and doing the plant stuff the most um, because that's what I'm doing the most. I'm not out in the streets organizing right now. I mean, I, I hope to be soon, hope to, you know, make those friends out here, but I don't have those uh, connections. It's it's just, just not really popping out here like it is in other places. Uh, And that's, you know, it is what it is, but I don't even know if that's the organizing I would really do out here, but it's like, I feel like uh, our podcast is more of like an anarchistic uh, intervention within the kind of permaculture world, which I think it really has a lot of problems with the funding models that resemble the NGO system and, you know, speaking in the language of, of, uh, liberation, but kind of acting in the, acting in the way of capitalism. And so I think there's really a, a lot to feel like it feels very meaningful to be carving out like a kind of, uh, anarcho, I don't want to say prepper-ish cause that's really not what we're doing, but we're, we're talking about building food autonomy and uh, really digging deep into plants that are historic and tough plants that can survive global warming. And, you know, there's nobody else really doing, doing it in that way. And so it's like, it's keeps shit interesting for me, you know? And what's cool, what's cool is when I hear from people, like I didn't do a book with this new album because I was like, I don't think anybody gives a fuck. And then like, I started hearing from people like, how come there's not a book this time? I was like, oh shit. Okay, cool. 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 Thank you. Thanks for that feedback. Appreciate it. Do a book next time. It was just weird. Cause we didn't have vinyls. Like what the fuck do we do? But, nice. um, but, but yeah, man, I, you know, at, at the end of the day though, I just really feel like with art and shit, it's like, I get it. You know, I want to listen to beach house when I'm like chilling, you know? Although I think their music's kind of radical. I think they, but that's, a, but it's like, you know, you want music that can like soothe you like, I don't know, like boards of Canada or whatever. But if you're fucking, you know, singing, I don't know. You, I think art fun art is best when it's like, you know, uh, advancing agendas and challenging people and helping people grow. I think that's, we don't need art that reinforces the status quo. There's enough fucking garbage in this world. There's enough garbage floating in that sea. If you catch my continental drift. <laughs> Double <laughs> entendre. Don't even ask me how. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, you know, speaking about your podcast, Propaganda of the Seed, which I highly recommend everyone to check out. I was, uh, you were getting more into to gardening and permaculture when you were in Denver and you had this awesome backyard oasis. And I was wondering if you could explain some awakenings and transformational experiences since you started interacting with land more and from learning more about permaculture to foraging. And now you live in Maine and living near beavers and growing much of your own food. Oh man, we could just do a whole podcast about this. <laughs> But trans, I mean, I'll say one transformational moment for me was um, just feeling like when I was leaving Denver, just really, I don't know if I started crying, but I was just, I remember at one point I was alone in the backyard and I was just so sad to be leaving that plot of land that I'd worked so hard on. And uh, it was a, a weird feeling to me to um, have such strong feelings about a place like that. Cause you know, we lived there for 10 years and we did, we made it. I mean, that little pond was fucking cool. Like the, we had frogs, there weren't, any, there aren't frogs in downtown Denver. You know, we had, it was fucking cool. And I learned just so much in that little space. That's where I like discovered perennial plants. Like I, all of a sudden, like arugula and mint and like things that I, I knew they were going to come back, but they just started coming back huge. And I was like, like lemon balm just uh, got me pumped. And I was like, Oh my God, lemon bomb. What is this? This is so cool. I have so much of this. So anytime anyone would come over, I'd give them lemon bomb. I'm sure I've given you. Lemon balm. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but you know, like, I mean, transformational moments. I mean, just right now, like just, it's like, you know, the end of the snow season, the end of the winter. And so I'm like, tapping maple trees. And so just, you know, I get to walk out to this little grove of maple trees behind my house and check on them and just going through having like being tuned into the season and have that be a part of my life is, um, is really incredible. You know, being able to take a bucket to the ocean by my house and then take it home and put it on my wood stove and dry it and making salt. 
things like that. It just blows my mind. Like I just did this interview with this like wild or wild plant person, um, Mallory O'Donnell. And in the interview, she was talking about making wild curries from the seeds in her that she forages. And I was like, fuck, I have all this mustard greens. I have all these, like all these seeds that I'm like selling some of them. I have so much of these other like weird seeds. And then I just started like mashing together all these seeds that I had and I made my own curry uh, spice. And I was like, I didn't even know you could do that, you know? Mm-hmm. And just like these little, um, you know, just like the little surprises, you know, like when you're like, like I'm hanging out, I think I'm tracking beavers, but then I like learn a little more and I find out I'm tracking otters, you know, and I realize, oh, I, I chased an otter through the woods, you know, like that's so, it's so cool. But also just, I mean, it's transformational to just get to actually like work with these things instead of just reading about them and like to really have the space to do a lot, you know, mm-hmm. um, like, like doing the podcast with Aaron is like, one of the most knowledgeable people on the specific subject of like food forestry, perennial, like, like he's one of the most knowledgeable people I would say in North America, if not, you know, I mean, he's definitely, and so it's incredible to just get to learn and to learn from someone like that and work with someone like that. And just all these plants that I'd like wondered about and read about for years, like learning how to grow them, learning how to propagate them, like knowing how to take 50 chestnut seeds and turn them into trees, you know, and just like going through those processes. Like I just, it's just awesome. Just the, the potential there. You know, it's great. And then going out there with your kids and seeing what they interact with and, and how that shapes the environment. It's like having like little people, you know, eating everything. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you. So one, uh, I want to, oh, 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 yeah. The, the, okay. The best one though, is like, we were going through some really fucking heavy shit, some heavy shit. And, uh, so we're like, Oh, let's go to on a vacation. And so we like went to the white mountains for the weekend and we came back and there was a fucking blue heron that had set up shop in our yard. And it wasn't just like, oh, wow. it wasn't just like hanging out in the water. It was just like walking all around our yard and it stayed there for a week and kept coming back throughout the summer. And I'm sure we'll see it again, but it was like, you know, letting the, the kids chase it around the yard. And it was like, I have, I mean, I don't know if I ever sent you those videos, but they're like fucking surreal, you know, like you're like hanging out with a fucking dinosaur and I'm like, I'm, I'm like working in the garden and then like not like 20, 15 feet away, 20 feet away. There's a blue hair and just chilling, trying to catch a frog. And I'm like, bird is as tall as I am. And it's just fucking hanging out. It was awesome. And I, I hope it hope it comes back. And like little things like that. Like I was starting to record a podcast the other day, and then I look out the window, and there's fucking the ducks had come back. You know, we have ducks that come back every year, and nice. sometimes, sometimes they lay ducks and ducklings, and we see you have ducklings in our yard. And it's just like it's like all the little surprises, the shit that you just like, the shit that's not in the books. You know, the stuff that's like a surprise is my favorite shit. It's just like just discovering things through serendipity basically. Yeah. And like the ecosystems that you create that don't even benefit you, you know, like all the animals that come and you benefit them. Yeah, totally. And well, I mean, what's cool is it's already like a wild nature preserve and we're pretty much leaving it that way. Um, and just putting in the plants that we want, you know, in a way that like leaves the sort of like wild wet stuff that the birds like and the other, you know, the things that they eat intact, but plus, you know, hazelnuts and apple trees and cool shit. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. I want to get to your new album with DJ Payne one post-American studies and you release this with your friend's label, Scott Crow. And he's also been like a mentor to you for years on emergency hearts just wanted to say like why you made that decision and shout out to the coffee with comrades episode where you also talk a little bit more about this which i'll link to again like thinking about the role of uh, uh, art and music with protest and radical politics um scott crow has really been someone who's been kind of instrumental in uh, my thinking about this stuff and and about just 
how, how I relate to anarchy and, uh, you know, refining my politics and shit. And just Scott's just a cool dude. He's a, you know, it's, it's good to have, you know, friends and mentors that have like, you know, been through things that you haven't and, you know, good advice is hard to come by in this, in this world, especially, uh, I don't know, especially like men, older men, like the, you know, there's just not a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of fucking assholes out there, put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so I don't know, I just struck up a friendship with Scott and, but he always really made me think about how important, um, just radical art is on its own. Right. You know, doesn't matter if like you're out there catching fucking bullets in the street for freedom or, you know, that's good too. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's like music is, is what it, is the number is one of the number one things that radicalizes people. And so he really helped me understand that. Yeah. And, you know, he's just been a good person that I've consulted with over the years, different things that I've been, that have been going on and activist stuff. And, you know, again, it's just good to have people that you can t- talk to and trust their opinion on. And um, yeah. And then, so, you know, Scott is part of like this whole industrial music, electronic music scene from the, uh, 90s, uh, 80s and 90s. And uh, it's like this kind of an- anarchistic, industrial, animal rights kind of scene that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty ignorant to a lot of it, but, um, you know, he wanted to make a record label that could like sort of be the flagship carrier for uh, this scene that wasn't, you know, this is the problem with like, there's been so much turnover in the music industry, all kinds of like genres of music. It's easy for things to like get, get lost if there isn't somebody like actively curating all this stuff, you know? Um, And so like some of that stuff um, from that time period, it, it, it needs, it needs like archival. It needs like, you know, people championing it. And so that's like what he's trying to do with his label is bring, bring together multiple genres and multiple generations of radical artists together on a label. Um, And it's a more, let's say a more anarchist vision for just putting out music. Um, And, and, you know, it's, there's just a lot of cool stuff going on. And um, just personally, I have a lot of shit going on in my life where I'm like trying to do a lot. And it's like, I'll take help where I can get it at this point. If people, if there's, if a good friend of mine wants to work with me on their label to help me get my music out there so that there's like certain shit I don't have to deal with so that I can have more time to do. (laughs) I mean, really these days, it's mostly diaper, changing diapers and putting puzzles together and shit. Um, That has beautiful work too, though. Yeah. I love it. I love it, man. Um, You know, it's, it's a, it's, that's the real privilege. The real privilege is being able to, you know, be home with my kids and, uh, be present in their lives. Cause a lot of, uh, a lot of dads don't get to do that, but, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's awesome to be on emergency hearts. Hope we do more shit and, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. check out the label. There's, you know, Mike Crenshaw's on there. There's tons of, tons of artists and new people signing. And so uh, I got, I'm expecting it to do really cool things over the next few years. Definitely. Thank you. I want to talk about the uh, track Welcome to the Future, where I think you're kind of putting like a, a framing to the Invisible Committee where you say, like, I don't need no Nazi to tell me the halls of power are empty. And then you also say, like, 2020 was the year the calendar broke. I was wondering since the pandemic, how you've been interacting with time differently. I mean, that's a really huge question honestly um because yes for yes you caught the invisible committee reference shout out to the invisible committee you asked me about a transformational experience with nature i'd be remiss if i didn't mention that like going to france you know and visiting tarnak the the small medieval town which is you know where a lot of like the community around the invisible committee type of ideas are are sort of building a little autonomous uh, living out there. And uh, just seeing that and seeing like radicals who were so deep in, uh, into s- struggle and theory, but also um, in a beautiful place and li- you know living off the land. And, and it really brings home a lot of those ideas about what it means to, you know, destitute power. How, how can you um, build your own, capacity to materially 
thrive um, outside of capitalism. So a mm-hmm. little thumbtack in that. And so how have I interacted with time differently in the pandemic? Well, you know, I, there were definitely points in the pandemic where, um, you know, I, I was able to collect some benefits and my wife as well. And also when my wife was working at her other job her for her last job, they basically just had her at home for over a year, if not longer. And she really didn't have a lot of responsibilities. I'll put it that way. And so we just, you know, we lost our childcare at that point. And so we were just home with our kids the whole time. And, um, because my main way of earning income is putting out records and using Patreon. It's like, I couldn't really, couldn't do a lot of the stuff I was doing because just everything seemed upside down uh, as far as like putting out records and touring and like the pandemic really fucked up my schedule. Uh, I had a lot of big plans for the years for the last year. And, and it's just like, and so I, and so because my time, my free time is limited because, you know, me and my wife, we split up our childcare and sometimes shit gets fucked up and we have to like hire a babysitter. When we pay a babysitter, it's usually like 20, 25 bucks an hour. We pay people a living wage to do anything, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you have to, it's fucking the future you know? Mm. Uh, but so sometimes I'll be like out in the yard and I'll be like, whatever, picking wild fucking herbs or something in, in the yard. And I'll be like, it's, it's like my work day. And this is what I'm choosing to do for my work is like fucking with plants. It doesn't pay me anything. It's not worth anything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I could make a song, but that's not where my heart, my heart is calling me to come outside or, or it's like when you have kids, your time becomes so commodified that it becomes a constant struggle because every second of the day you're responsible for like this little person. And so every moment you have, so all my work time becomes like my, my, just my time. Um, But it just forces me to like, you know, push, do whatever I can to push market logic out of my life as much as I can. Um, you know, I'm in a place in my life where I kind of wish I made a little more money trying to figure that out. Um, at the same time, if I want to just go outside and go jogging because I, I I feel crazy, then I'm going to fucking go jogging. You know what I mean? I, I don't care if like, that's not what a 40 something year old man is supposed to do because capitalism says I should be working on my business or I should be fucking doing this or creating some bullshit meme to sell more shirts. You know what I mean? It's like at a certain point, it's like the way that social media and tech companies have like colonized our time, you know, as Mackenzie Wark talked about, like even play resembles work now. And so even like, I mean, just to I mean, if you really think about it, it's like while I'm out there, if I'm if I'm doing that stuff, and then I take a fucking Instagram photo of it, you know, all of a sudden, like, is it work? Is it play? What's going on here? Everything is blurred. Every part of your life is for sale. You know, really, I feel like in the pandemic, I've tried to draw some more lines in my life, mm-hmm. where I I, uh, I want to be a little bit more reclusive move going into the future. And yeah, I might might still look at this stuff, but I'm I'm not going to be, I don't work for social media companies. I'm a fucking musician. I make fucking music. I'll put that shit out. You know, now I sell seeds, you know, put that shit out, but we can't let tech companies monetize every minute of our fucking lives. You know, if we, the amount of time that I've spent chasing algorithms uh, over the years is, is fucking insane. You know, the algorithm I want to chase is fucking nature. You know, I want to get out there. I want to fucking move around, grow some food, have some fun. These life sucking fucking, <laughs> you know, just yeah. shit. it's fucking awful, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, So, yeah, I mean, and, you know, and the other thing I'll say about like the the time thing is like, you know, they gave all that money out to so many people, like, you know, most of it went to like billionaires who didn't need it anyway, but it just, it also showed you how like so many of the illusions that hold our society together were just like rendered obsolete in the pandemic, you know, Um, like actually you don't have to fucking work for the economy to still work. Actually, 
you know, actually um, no one has to work actually fucking, you know, healthcare should be free. Actually, you know what I mean? Like, like actually fuck college debt, actually, you know, actually fuck landlords actually, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a fascinating time to be alive, man. And I think, you know, what it means to be free and is something we have to always think about because, you know, in this fucking gig economy world, like, you know, uh, as invisible committee says, we're all like forced to become entrepreneurs of the self. And, um, I do a little bit of that because it enables me a little bit of freedom, but also fuck that shit. You know, you gotta draw, you gotta, so it's all about finding your balance with all these things and, uh, taking your time back, man, taking your time back. I mean, you know, and, and like, that's an echoing theme throughout my music, because I think the first time I, 20 years ago, reading like uh, Marx's concept of alienated labor, it fucking blew me away. It makes sense. Like, think about it. People spend their whole lives and they don't own their fucking time. Like you sleep eight hours of the day, you fucking work eight hours of the day, you come home, and, you know, there's, there's not a lot, you know, there's a lot, there's a, we could do a lot better. You could, we could do a lot better with our lives. Definitely. And, and you, you bring up a lot of these topics on that, on the track blacklisted from the album. Uh, I really like the line. You say you don't even own your hot takes. And like you talk about how we work for these corporations. I think you make an allusion to the book, the shallows. Yeah. And yeah, it's a great track. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I was just listening to new nuclear winter three, a weird record, but, uh, there, there's that song, um, wall street the i'm the king of new york where i'm like rapping like i'm a wall street oh yeah i'm like you know wall street's you know just another another fucking thing you don't own nothing no one owns but yeah so i want to talk to you about your track uh no guarantees and you already went into this a little bit but uh you one of the lines you said my best shows had no guarantees and you already talked about tarnak sad a lot i was wondering if you could talk about athens or like how other countries or radical communities interact with art and support artists. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting because on one level, like a venue like Rhinoceropolis or like the kind of DIY venues we used to go to Mm. um, a lot of those things like would still exist in Europe, um, you know, 40 years later in, in places like Switzerland, Germany, France, maybe France gets got a little tougher uh, over the years, but um, in, in various Eastern European places where, you know, what starts off as like a punk DIY kind of thing becomes like this, like radical kind of counter institution in their cities. And so like, even though it, it functions like a club, it like runs like a collective and there are people bringing in um, multiple genres of music and uh, more experimental, riskier stuff, uh, and really paying people well. So, you know, I could, you know, play shows in Europe and get, get paid quite well for, um, for that work. And at the same time, there would be other shows where people would reach out from like Athens or whatever, uh, like Antifa live in Athens would be like, Hey, um, we can't offer to pay you anything. We're anti-capitalist, but you know, we can bring you out. And you can play this like show in a squatted uh, plaza and, um, you know, come check it out. And, you know, doing things like that is fucking awesome because, you know, and I go out there and make like some real friends. I, and I get to, you know, I got to see people throwing Molotovs in the street and, you know, (laughs) and, uh, and also just like getting, getting, being able to like go from like squat to squat like, Oh, this, this place used to be a fucking mansion with a gigantic lawn. And now there's people growing food here and it's a squat, you know? Um, and there'd be like fucking hip hop squats and, you know, every squat would have like a fitness gym. And I mean, people, it's just fucking cool. I mean, that shit really exists out there. And, uh, you know, Athens was fucking awesome. Went back there a couple of times with the anti anti for live. And, um, yeah, I mean, things like that are like my favorite memories is like, um, and really, and also just a lot of times, you know, that, that concept or that line, uh, my best shows had no guarantees. It's like, you know, yeah, maybe I got paid some ridiculous amount of money to play some show in some country and it was cool. It was fine. 
you know, I got paid. That's nice. So I have to eat, but I had way more fun at the show where I didn't get paid shit, you know, mm-hmm. um, like just because like the big shows have like a sterile kind of vibe and I don't know. Yeah. Um, or they can, you know, but yeah. And even like in the States and various tours, I can, you know, I, I can like flashback to like certain, like just events where, you know, I knew I wasn't going to make a shit ton of money, but it just felt so fucking good. It didn't matter. Yeah. That's what my best shows had no guarantees is about. Yeah. Like what kind of lessons people can learn. I mean, I think, I think just having music institutions that exist is a lesson people can learn, (laughs) like keeping things going, you know, (laughs) like DIY spaces fucking matter, you know, like, like keeping them. And, And the thing I think in the States that happens is like, and I don't mean to offend anybody by saying this, but like, there's just like a vibe of fuck it in a lot of these places where it's like, people are just kind of living these places and a lot of DIY stuff can be good or really bad. I wish that, uh, I don't know. I wish D, the, I wish, I hope to see more DIY spaces where people take like the financial aspect of it a little more serious while you know keeping shit gnarly because at the end of the day right right you know in whatever fucking year it is you know the five dollar show from fugazi uh, is 22 dollars now adjusted for inflation and it w- it's actually more probably like 26 dollars now adjusted for inf- pandemic inflation and, you know, if you think about how, how much work it is to drive from like one city to the next and to be standing at a merch booth all night and, you know, just all the, all, all it takes to put on shows, you know, it's really tiring. And part of why I don't do it as much anymore is just because I just got so exhausted with it. If somebody drives six hours to play a fucking show, I think a hundred dollars is not like a good amount of money. You know, you're basically paying everybody a dollar fifty an hour to to participate. So, yeah. Um, and I'm not like trying to talk shit. Like I get it. Like there's no, you know, we're all just rubbing pennies together. But um, I wish yeah. DIY. I wish there was more radical DIY infrastructure and more like more funding for that stuff, um, especially uh, you know with like the the wreckage of the Spotify based music industry, the winner take all algorithm wars it's it's a difficult time to be an independent artist it's, there's a lot of people have a lot of challenges thank you um, i want to talk about this song the comments this song is really good it's deep it, it really reminds me of vine deloria jr he had once said that he really felt bad for the the irish and the scots and the, a lot of the europeans because they were colonized first and he was speaking before the indigenous communities and that they were already lost and that their religion had pretty much become capitalism. And I really think you touch on that so deeply in the song, the comments. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk about this song a little bit more you bring up so many good points in it. Like, can we live without domination and talk about kind of your history and your ancestors too? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I guess I'll start by just giving credit where credit's due. I never really thought about this stuff in the way that I did until I was reading Negri and Hart's book, Commonwealth. And they tell this story of um, dispossession of the land of uh, peasants in medieval Europe. And, uh, you know, I've encountered things, you know, little learned things here and there, critical race theory, things that like about, um, you know, stuff you, you talked about on your podcast, Bacon's Rebellion with um, Gerald Horn. I, I, I really loved bo- both of your interviews with him. People should go listen to those, especially like white people who want to learn more about what I'm talking about. I actually got a lot of inspiration from that song, from that song, listening to, after listening to one of those interviews. And yeah, and like this idea of, you know, there's a couple of things going on there. First of all, it's like really trying to own you know, my place in this shit as a white man, you know what I mean? Like really trying to take responsibility for my history, but address it in a productive way, you know, um, not be like reductive about things and to try to be, to tell, tell a story about the original, some of the originally colonized people or the first victims. And I've never read that 
what that other thing you were talking about. Um, but that sounds right. And that's, but I was drawing on it more from like through the analysis I gained from, uh, Hart and Negri, who people don't like anymore, which is fine. I don't have an opinion on that. Uh, I side with not liking them now, which is fine. Yeah. And so this idea of the commons, and it's like people have asked, like even like reached out to me and asked me about the commons, like multiple different times. Like you talk about the commons. Can you explain what it is? The commons is what everything used to be. People used to hold everything in common, you know? And, you know, my friend, Anthony maintained, he's a baker. And he was like, yeah, man, we were talking about this shit. He's like, yeah, people used to bake bread in common ovens. You know, if you were going to put all that effort into firing up the fucking you know, oven with wood and shit to, to make bread, you might as well invite all the neighbors over so everyone can do it, you know, in these like things make sense of like, you know, people holding things in common, you know, that's natural, you know, uh, letting your sheep graze the land, knowing what's there, foraging the land. And, you know, a lot of this, you know, and some permaculture shit, a lot of the stuff I'm growing, sorrel, good King Henry, Turkish rocket, a lot of these things are what Europeans ate for thousands of years. This is what people ate. They forged this stuff. All these things grew. Um, and we just don't eat those things anymore. And so through forest gardening and learning all this stuff, I'm like, you know, it's a part of, it's a way for me to kind of like get a taste of my history, you know, my own personal history. I'm like part Polish. My grandfather was a Polish orphan. My other um, side of the family and my mother's side of the family, they claim like Viking by way of Ireland or Scotland. I, I sometimes get it twisted. And uh, yeah, and so that's their history. They, you know, they came to came to Ireland as uh, invaders, you know, stuck around and then uh, got colonized as well, you know. And yeah, and, and like there's a lot I don't know on the subject. And so part of me was like, fuck, I don't even know if I should even open my mouth on this shit, you know, like, cause I really, I really don't, I, I haven't found a good book to really learn more about this subject. I've caught little hints of these like stories of the white race from like settlers by Jay Sakai. I learned a lot about the subject in that book, about like the history of settlers. Um, but a lot of people also have like challenged a lot about that book. And so I don't, you know what I mean? It's like hard to like, mm -hmm. like, it's not a subject that there's a lot of readily information, you know, there's not good information about it. And also like, I guess I never really wanted to learn my history because that always seemed like some white supremacist shit. I was more into like <laughs> black culture, <laughs> you know, as a kid, uh, hip hop and shit. And I, you know, I always view like people with like Irish pride and shit as like a form of racism because most of the people I grew up with who were like, you know, I super Irish or super Italian were also like kind of racist, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's also like trying to like find a place uh, where trying to find a place where I can at least talk about those things and acknowledge those things and acknowledge, like allow a little space for my own history here to find a more productive way to think about, think about our history. Because I just think a lot of white people just, you know, there's like, some ego wrapped up in their privilege discourse and uh, they should, you know, hum humble themselves a little, I guess, and learn yeah. more about where they came from because, you know, half of them weren't even white when they got here. You know, Irish people weren't white, you know, every single, every single round of immigration almost seems like it gets, uh, you know, throughout history gets a wave of like, you're not, you're not real, really white. And like, this is one of the things you guys really, I think honed in on well in your interview with Gerald Horn is like talking about, again, just the importance of um, Bacon's rebellion. And just like before that, this word white didn't even fucking exist. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, the only reason it was even codified as a thing was because white sharecroppers and black slaves fucking revolted together. They had, they had, they had interests, they had mutual, mutually, uh, they had interests. And, and so they had to, they, they, they had to figure out a way to make it so that they would no longer have mutual interests in the future. And so they created like this other tier of, you know, whiteness and codified it 
you know, and I, I, granted I'm like preaching to the choir, but that's like where it gets disingenuous when, you know, you talk about, oh, well, the guy, the leader of the proud boys is a Latino. And it's like, well, that's how whiteness works. It's, it's, that's precisely how white supremacy functions that and know your, learn your history, white people, uh, because we have a rich, we, have, some of us have a rich history too. And it doesn't, somebody, <laughs> our ancestors were all, also most likely defeated by terrible people yeah yeah these like same institutions and no yeah well said on on whiteness and and your your song really ties in a lot with uh roxanne dunbar ortiz and her book a people's indigenous history and how she talks about how there was irish reservations that england had set up and that white supremacy goes back to the crusades and like you talked about with Gerald Horn, and he talks about these embryos of whiteness. And you do a really good job with that because not only do you talk about, you know, pagans and earth-based uh, worship and, and thought of like the Celtic and the Vikings and Scottish, but like you don't give it a pass because you also swing the pendulum back and analyze whiteness and settlerism. And I really like this, this one part where you say, the earth wasn't a thing to conquer, it was a complexity. And then you're talking about a devil came in clutching deeds and rosaries and then the, how the violence circulated with enslavement of Africans on North America and then the attempted genocide of the indigenous as well. It's just a, it's a really good song. So thank you. Well, thanks, man. And again, like, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to tread lightly with that song. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I hope to, you know, learn more about this subject through that song. So, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely like, you know, it's also like the kind of information white people should be careful with. It's not, it's not to like win arguments and shit like that. It's, it's just to deepen, you know, your understanding so that you can you know, come from a place of solidarity in a more, you know, in a more honest way, you know? Yeah. And, and I remember I was in your garden in Denver and you gave me some sorrel once and I didn't even know what sorrel was. And you told me, try this like it has vitamins like this is what our peasant ancestors ate and when i ate that it was it was an awesome experience so thank you for for giving me that experience fuck yeah dude well uh i'll send you some seeds i just uh, got my first batch of seeds oh, i'd love to grow some but yeah i mean yeah and, and i do like tying it back to food you know mm -hmm. it's like uh it's fascinating. It's like, you know, you know, on the settler tip, like another one of these plants I'd read so much about ground nuts, these, the kind of, uh, potato that's like high in protein that grows in the ground as a, kind of like a peanut, but it's, it's, I don't know, they used to call them earth chestnuts and, uh, indigenous people, it was a staple crop of various tribes of North America. I'd been like, you know, trying to grow it in Denver and like one of these plants, like it's so expensive online. I was like canoeing on the river behind my house and the, whole, the Androscoggin, Androscoggin river oh, is yeah. behind my house. That's not, that's not a white, white person name. And uh, the, it, the whole riverbanks are just covered with these like ground nuts. Wow. And I was like, man, you know, they, you know, they were, they use these as travel ways. They maintained these stands of uh, ground nuts and now they're everywhere. That's incredible. You know, this plant, it's like delicious, kind of tastes like a taro or something. And uh, it, uh, you know, it's just growing behind my house. And, but that's the legacy of uh, the peoples who were here before that, that gets into like more complicated issues of like settlerism and like how, how I relate to those things. I'm still like, I don't know, still stuff I'm carefully thinking through, you know, just trying to uh, be respectful with those things, but also learn more about them and try to incorporate them more into my, into my life. Thank you. I was wanting to ask you about your last track, Post-American Studies. And you have this one part where you say, still trying to figure out what a father is. And like the first part of that question is kind of like, how has being a father changed your focus on on life and, and music and art or whatever and the the last part is like what's the next chapter you imagine in this this book i i see your album as this book like post-american studies that you hope to read or write or is it being written right now well i don't know if i you know i mean post-american studies as you know was 
like originally when we conceptualized it, I was like telling Payne one, I'm thinking about changing the name of my podcast to post American studies, but I also like it for our album. He's like, dude, just do both. Like it's like, fuck it. That sounds cool to me. I'm yeah. like, cool. Fuck it. And then like, then I started doing the podcast and I got a couple interviews recorded for like post American studies. And I was like, you know what? This is basically just the soul cast kind of rebranded. And like, granted, like a lot of it, that's like what it is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so much of it, shit today is just marketing, you know, and, and just at, at, a, at a certain point, it's just like, I just like, you can't do this anymore. I just can't fucking just read books and mind them. I like, I stopped enjoying reading and, you know, all these things. And so I had to like really slow down with the podcast. Part of that is about parenting. You know, it's like, there's like so much going on in your fucking head. Like, how does it change you? It's like, man, you're not, I get now why people just fall the fuck off, you know, when they have kids, because it's like, like, if you're doing it right, in my opinion, you know, if you're doing it right, it's really not about you anymore. It's really about, uh, nurturing these little people who are in your care in this fucking fucked up world and just giving them the tools and resources and experiences to to thrive you know and you know it's such a huge time commitment that like i used to think i just didn't i thought i was just like living this life of leisure all the time but really really i was working all the time i just didn't conceive of it as such you know because i wasn't I didn't have that, like, you know, I wasn't being paid an hourly wage. I was just doing whatever I, whatever I felt, whatever I wanted to do. And yeah. And so having kids just changes all that. It, uh, it makes me, I mean, it makes me want to, you know, I've never really cared that much about money, but like we send our kid to a school that costs money. You know, we like to keep lots of fucking blueberries in the freezer and you know what I mean? It's like shit. I don't want to like, you know, freak out over a thousand dollar bill. Well, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be poor for the rest of my life, I guess. And so that's definitely like a factor of like, okay, how do I, you know, keep doing all the shit I, I, that make, that is important to me, but at the same time, like start like saving for retirement and shit. Cause I don't have, a, I don't have, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so, you know, trying to figure out what a father is, it's like, you know, questioning, you know, masculinity and, you know, patriarchy and, you know, trying to be a good dad. You know, it's like my, the most important thing to me these days is uh, just, you know, I don't know, being present. Like my father, you know, he made money, but he wasn't present. You know, he worked himself so hard that he couldn't do it without being like addicted to the drugs that killed him, you know, like, <laughs> You know, that's, that's, that's a, I don't want people to sum up my life that way, you know? Yeah. Um, so I stick with drugs that hopefully won't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. Folks. <laughs> Man. I, and, and, I, and I don't mean to be like Debbie Downer about like having kids. It's like the dopest shit. Um, mm -hmm. Especially now it's like, I have like a five-year-old and a two and a half year old and like they're thick as thieves and like, you know, we were just, I mean, literally just running around in the woods the other day, yesterday, it was like 50 degrees, all the snow melted. And so like, there's these little red berries called winter berries out here. It's like what they make Tom's of Maine toothpaste from the uh, winter green. And they have these little red berries that are like frozen under the snow. And, you know, the kids were just having a blast, just foraging these, uh, these berries yesterday. And I was just like, man, this is fucking awesome. We're just beautiful day we're just walking around hanging in the woods like this is awesome that's beautiful yes it is i agree i feel very lucky and i feel lucky to you know whatever i just get to fucking blab a lot of a lot of the time <laughs> it's it's awesome well one last question to allow you to blab they i think one of the reasons you stayed such a good artist and always been one of my favorite lyricists is that you have this curiosity and you're open to new ideas. Like you've never fell into dogma, even though dogma in some things is good. Like, like as Cornell West has pointed out, like a dogma for your family and to love them, that's a good dogma. But like you've strayed away from, from these things and stayed open to new ideas and this curiosity, like, where do you get that? I don't 
probably where I get it. You know, I do, I, I do, you know, like I was talking about how I wish I was a professor, you know, I think I have like an inferiority complex or something on some level that makes me like really respect like academics and theorists and like, and really I can really develop a deep profound, like these days I develop like deep profound respects for like plant breeders, you know, um, and wild chefs. And like, it's just, it's fascinating to me how quickly I can like latch onto something, you know, and just run with it and, but do so in a way that is like, feels honest. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting because I don't know. I, I guess, I guess I think I I felt like, I feel like with having a platform comes responsibility. And so I've always like kind of accepted that responsibility and tried to, and this isn't totally how I think about these things either, but like try to like, think like, what would I respect in an artist, you know, Mm -hmm. the kind of things that they, that they would put out there into the world. Um, But really at the end of the day, it's just like, I have a fucking short attention span, you know, life, life is life is fucking short, but life is long. (laughs) And I just like, I've just always been really put off about like certainty, you know, especially in politics. It's like anytime, whether they're doesn't, I don't, doesn't matter if they're an anarchist or communist, like you're talking about dogma. It's like, you know, I've always approached, I approach everything with a, a certain amount of skepticism and, you know, there are things that I'll hold like the quote unquote party line on you know, that those things are non-negotiable, <laughs> you know, capitalism is non-negotiable, <laughs> you know, fucking sexism, misogyny, homophobia, racism, you know, anti-fascism, like all these things are, uh, you know, they're non-negotiable, you know, there are certain things that I will like hold the party line on, you know, you know, woke, uh, call out culture. Like I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, if I have to choose, that's the side I'm on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I don't know what that has to do with curiosity. I don't know, man. I just, um, I I just, I just like, I'm just curious, man. You know, curiosity killed the cat, man. And it's like self sab It's really an act of self-sabotage because like a lot of things, like if I just kept doing the same thing for a little bit longer, like a little bit the same, a little more consistently, maybe I'd have like had a little more success in certain things, but I just get like, you know, bored, have to move on to the next thing, but it happens, you know, very naturally. It's just like, you know, thinking about uh, an interview I did with my friend, Scott Campbell, um, about like mind and body anarchism. And it's something that always like really clicked with me was like, does it sit like when something is happening, like, you you know, you run it through your mind, your heart and your uh, gut. And if it doesn't sit with all three parts of your body, then like something's not right you know, and you should listen to that. And I think that's like a, it's kind of like a, a really, I don't know, materialist, but new agey way of thinking about that stuff, you know, because I know exactly what he means. It's like, sometimes shit just, it's like, maybe it's right, but it doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. You know? And, uh, it's like the vibe check. Yeah. It's like the vibe check, you know? And so it's like, anytime I'm like, like my vibe check with my right self doesn't sound right, seem right. It's like, man, then time to change what you're doing, you know, like stop reading fucking theory books. Like you're, you're in a rut. Like I was in a rut. And so I like had, so I had to stop reading theory books. You know what I mean? I just couldn't, it was hurting my eyes. I thought I needed glasses. You know what I mean? I didn't need glasses. I needed to, uh, read some science fiction, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then it's like, cause you know, it's like, especially as an artist, it's like, we are what we eat, you know? And so like the, like the constant doom stro- scrolling, you know, coming from a place of anger, you know, all that stuff. It's like, well, what are, you know, what are some other things I want to feed myself? So I've been reading more science fiction, reading about more plants playing video games, <laughs> you know, I don't know, man. It's, yeah. uh, it's, I mean, it's the only way to have just to personally maintain, you know, on some real shit. It's like, if you're not constantly like trying to learn new things, you're not growing, you know, you're going to get stuck. 
you know, you know, we're constantly building new neuro pathways our whole lives. You know, they're doing all this, you know, they used to say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but it's like, man, we're living in the future now. We know that's not true. You know, old, old dogs can learn many new tricks and it's a matter of survival. You know, if you're not constantly like mulling over some new idea or, you know, if you know, you know, we need things to like be excited about, you know, we need things that are like inspiring us. You know, we're talking about science fiction earlier, but it's like, now I'm inspired. Like I was going to build a, uh, like I was like next year, I'm just growing tomatoes, kale and potatoes. And then like when I went to buy seeds, I just bought the most frou-frou, just ridiculous shit. Like shit I've never even fucking heard of. Like, I don't even know if I can grow it here, but like my garden this year is going to be like a fuck it garden. You know, it's a play. It's just a play garden. It was a concept we read about in uh, that Aaron actually drew out of the new David Graeber book was like that, like old civilizations, um, hunter gatherer societies had play gardens. And, uh, and I was like, and I was like, man, that is so cool. Like they have all the food that they need, but just for fun, they're growing food, you know, for play. And it's like, man, that's what I'm doing this year. I'm doing a fucking play garden. Like I can still buy fucking potatoes and rice at the store. I'm just going to fucking have some fun with this shit, do some weird stuff this year, you know? Um, But that's all coming back to like keeping things fresh, not getting stuck in a rut. And like, but again, like I know people, you can be successful if you just do the same thing over and over again in almost any, in a lot of fields. But at the end of the day, you have to fucking live with yourself. So, you know, remember that kids, you are what you eat, eat, eat good shit. So it reminds me of Tidnan Han, rest in peace. When he said what you consume is also like what, like what media you consume is also a form of eating and it has, it, it changes you. Yeah. What it, you, said. you know? Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Uh, yeah. But also like uh, you are what you do, you know, yeah. another bumper sticker. It's true. You are what you do. So I think about that when I think about like how much time did I spend uploading videos to social media platforms and coming up with a clever way of saying the same thing again to drive content. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, is it, you are what you do, right? So I guess I'm a social media consultant for a rap brand. That's deep. Raps, raps, rap song won't ever change the world But I'll tell you about a couple that changed me And saved me from a system that could have strangled me these are my post-American studies We watch for rising waters Surprised by dry lightning Fire season comes early I no longer want to die fighting A middle finger for the gainfully employed What is a man but a thing to be destroyed My b-boy stance is a buffalo stance Damn it feels good To be going extinct Washing fresh potatoes and carrots in the sink like I give a fuck what you think I screamed death to America When it happened to tear it up Froze up, had to look hard in the mirror You never know you're ready for war Until you cock it You never know how good you got it So you say fuck it Let the chips fall, it's a sick world I ain't selling a cure So many plague doctors sold snake oil here before But before it's too late, plot your escape If you're not careful, this beast will drag you to the brink this is my institute for post-American studies Calluses on my lips, my throat been bloodied From screaming into empty buildings with people in them Mass organizing till mass media undid them Every gesture is a ripple, this is true, but truthfully Fuck the dead white men in my library Nowadays there's only one book I can read Post-American studies I need glasses I need a million dollars to wipe my ass with I need New England liberals to be less classist I need my fellow revolutionaries To stop LARPing and start packing Gandhi and Walnut died I don't have dogs anymore But when I'm in my garden Catch me chilling with a dinosaur Used to want a flamingo on my front lawn I got one Old dreams dead and gone Now it's just me getting a blue hair on and digging a dad is some real shit Lately it's been like carrying fam through the desert Wondering if we'll all make it I can't fall if I do they'll be fatherless And I'm still trying to figure out what a father is The United States Most sociopathic actors hide behind American flags 
flags and blue lives matter banners And I ain't talking about the cops who we'll shot from that Talking about your racist uncle who kills ants with a magnifying glass I mean really, why is that? Until we sort it out, it's non-stop civil conflict We'll traumatize comrades, shout each other down Cause we feel powerlessness of it all I'll be drinking the coffee while it lasts Or yo pawn tea for caffeine when there's no more coffee beans Sorry if I don't reply to your texts I'm busy with these post-American studies Damn, it feels good to be a college dropout Who never even saw his high school degree But don't cry for me, not a tear will be shed by the rising seas Get these post-American studies And we won't need big agriculture, we can farm the trees After this, we won't need social workers or psychiatry Word to Sage Francis, this life could be so easy Get these, po these post-American studies My vantage point, the edge of empire For now the land of pine trees Where I learn to actually do something Instead of just being somebody Nowadays, there's only one book I can read Get, get, get these post-American studies It's written all around me Scrawled on beach whales and flooded streets In my country, to see is not to Believe. Shame on y'all. These, these, these post American studies. These post American studies. That was the song Post American Studies. Please support Soul and DJ Pam One's new album. I have their Bandcamp links in the show notes. Thanks to Soul for taking the time to speak with me. Thanks for sharing the show around and supporting the podcast and Patreon. Thanks to Awareness for the music, and see you next time. <laughs>